Hello, everyone. It's working. It's working. Yeah. So, welcome back to um, to our um, one of our last sessions on um, primitives three. Um, before we start, we have a couple of announcements. So, remember today there is this organ concert. Um, you can find the instructions on um, on the web page. They have been posted. There are a few buses. Um, one is at uh, five forty, and and the other at. Uh, five past six but we encourage everyone to walk so there will be a walking caravan um, leaving from the um, here the front the front door at um, quarter to six because we don't have enough bu buses for everybody um, another announcement is that um, we found a, a mobile phone so please check uh, if you have your mobile phone and just come on the front uh, desk to get it Okay, so now um, we start the session, and the first talk will be given by Geoffroy Couteau, um, who presents joint work with Chris Bruska on building fine-grain one-way functions from strong average case hardeners. So, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so the story starts with uh, uh, a 1995 work of uh, Russell Impagliazzo, who asked. What world do we live in, right? Because we cryptographers, we, uh, we hope and believe that, that we live in a world that uh, Russell Impagliazzo coined uh, cryptomania, where public cryptography exists, so we get to write nice papers, attend nice conferences, and also uh, secure our data. And there's also the possibility that we don't have public key encryption to public key crypto, but we still have symmetric cryptography, so we can still do well, many things um, of interest. At the other end of the spectrum, there is a possibility that P is equal to NP, so all crypto is broken, but many people in the more algorithmic side are happy because they can uh, solve the traveling salesman problem, so they're uh, very happy about it. And that would also be fine if they lived in the world heuristica, where P is not equal to NP, but P is still equal to NP on average. So you still don't have crypto, but you can solve all NP problems very efficiently on average. So essentially, in those four worlds, some computer scientists are always happy. Then there is the middle possibility, the fifth world, which in Pagli had so-called Pessiland, which is a logical possibility that cryptography does not exist. You don't have one-way functions, nothing. But you have a lot of uh, NP problems, which are hard on average. So you don't get even fast algorithms. So that's the worst of all possible lands. And something often called in Pagliazzo's program will be, uh, is can we rule out this world? Can we show that computer scientists are bound to be at least somewhat happy? If we could do that, that would be a win-win for humanity. We will know that either we do have some crypto or we have fast algorithms. And fortunately, uh, it turns out to be a very hard problem. And the core issue is that if we look at the hierarchy of hardness assumptions related to this world, so the bottom being worst case hardness, the top being public key encryption, we know that there are black box separations between any two of these uh, hardness assumptions. So it's not possible to rule out the existence of some of these, uh, the logical possibility of these worlds, just using black box techniques. What might save us, or where we can find a ray of hope, is that the real landscape is actually a bit more subtle. It's known that in some levels of this hierarchy, uh, if we look at extreme hardness, then that gets us uh, somewhat in the higher level. So for example, exponential worst case hardness does imply average case hardness. This is classical least decoding algorithms. Or at the top of the hierarchy, if you have exponentially hard one-way functions, this actually gives you quadratically hard public key encryption. So maybe there's hope. And the main question we ask is, could it be possible that extreme average case hardness suffices to imply a very weak form of one-way functions? So this is what we study in this talk. So if we could do that, we could rule out an extreme version of Pestiland, the worst of all possible lens. So I have to explain a bit more what we mean by very weak one-way functions and extreme average case hardness. By very weak one-way functions, in this talk, I will mean specifically fine-grained one-way functions. I'll explain right after what it means, but it's possibly one of the weakest notions of one-way functions you could imagine. Then for extreme average case hardness, we look at different notions right, from the, from the weaker to the stronger, which we call exponential average case hardness, amplifiable average case hardness, and the new notion that we call block finding average case hardness. So let's explain these terms before I can go on with, with the results. 
What's a fine one way, one way function? Well, your typical one way function takes time n to evaluate and maybe two to the n to invert or something way too long. Fine one one way function, we just want that inverting text takes time at least n to the one plus epsilon for some positive constant epsilon, right? It's slightly harder to invert than it is to evaluate. It's really the minimal amount of uh, non triviality to get something that the adversary can't do as efficiently as yourself. So this is a fine grained one way function. And then we have these uh, various notions of average case hardness. So exponential average case hardness is quite natural. Uh, essentially, what it says is that if you have an NP language, the best an adversary can do uh, to, find whether, to find out whether words belong to the language is uh, try all possible witnesses uh, in uh, exponential time until it lands on the witness. So that maybe it can get some speed up, but in the end, it will still take uh, exponential time to decide membership to the language. So if we could show that exponential average case hardness implies fine one way functions, we will get a win-win result, which is that we either have some weak form of cryptography or all NP languages can be decided in time less than two to the n on average. That would be nice. And fortunately, our first result is that this is not possible with black box proof techniques. Um, so this result turns out to be actually not too hard, uh, but what we would really like, of course, will be a positive result. So we, we say, okay, what happens if we start from even stronger notions of average case hardness. What do we get out of that? The first natural candidate is what we call amplifiable average case hardness. So remember, at, uh, average case hardness, exponential average case hardness, I give you a word. You have to decide whether it's in the language. It takes time to do the n. I say that it's amplifiable if when I give you m words, to decide for all of them if they belong to the language, you need times m times 2 to the n. Right? The more you have words, the more you need to spend time to decide. So. Basing Frank one way function on this will still give a win-win for humanity because you would either have crypto or a faster than two to the n algorithm to decide all NP languages when amortizing over many instances. So that would already be a nice win-win. And another motivation for this study is that, is that in the past, assuming non-amortizability has been the key to circumvent some impossibility results. So it helped, for example, getting uh, N squared hard public key encryption with negligible security error. So there, the authors had to assume a dream XOR lemma that says that XORing hard predicates amplifies RDS optimally. And without it, it's black box impossible to achieve that. Or it was also used in a very nice recent work to show that if you have one-way functions with some amplifiable hardness, then you get collision resistant hash functions. While without it, it's a black box impossible. So we thought, okay, maybe this is the key to, uh, to getting our fine grained one-way function. And it was not. So our second result is that there is still no black box construction of fine grained one-way function for any arbitrarily small constant epsilon, even starting from this insanely strong notion of, of average case hardness. So not great for humanity, but uh, let's not stop here. And then so we looked at an even stronger hardness notion, which we call block finding hardness. So the previous one said, I give you M words, if you have to decide for all of them whether they belong to the language, you need to spend times m times 2 to the n. Block finding hardness says that something that it's even hard to decide something about the membership of these words to the language. So for example, I give you the pattern 0, 1, 0, 0, and I tell you, can you find four consecutive words such that if you look at whether they belong to the language or not, the answer will give you 0, 1, 0, 0. So block finding hardness essentially says that just to answer this question, can you find a pattern of uh, membership bits uh, for, uh, for m words, this already requires time m times 2 to the n. So that would still give some very weak positive, like win-win result, right? If we had finite one way function from that, either you have crypto or you can decide something non-trivial uh, about the uh, membership, the pattern of uh, membership bits for all NP languages. Quite weak though. But still, from this one, we do manage to get a fine grained one-way function with a quadratic hardness gap. So it rules out at least some extreme, extreme version of Pessiland, if you want. So in the rest of this talk, I'll go over the techniques we introduced to, uh, to solve these problems. And one central unifying theme is the notion of a random language in NP. So what's a random language? Well, take a universe, okay, many possible words in it. And you flip a coin for each of these words. With priority 1 over 2, you put it in the language. With priority 1 over 2, you put it outside of the language. So then your language, in the end, contains roughly half of the words. Now I want this language to be an NP. So I take a set of witnesses. And for each word of the universe, I pick a uniformly random witness in the set. And I say that this is a witness associated to this word. OK? 
And then I give a check oracle to the adversary. So this check oracle receives queries of the form XW, where X is a word and W is a candidate witness. And the check oracle checks whether this is the right witness associated to this word. If it is, then it tells you whether the word was in the language or not. If it's not, it, te it tells you nothing. So this is equivalent to taking a random language in NP intersect co NP. And when the adversary manages to find the right witness, we call his query a hit. Okay, it's a terminology that I'm going to use a lot in the rest of this talk. So the point of these random languages, well, there are, there are two points. First, they help us checking that uh, uh, hypothesis we make about average case languages are plausible because we can check whether they at least hold for a random language. And it's also the basis for all of our black box separations. So more precisely, we prove three things. Uh, we prove that a random language satisfies block finding hardness. So that gives support for the plausibility of this strong notion of block finding hardness. In the same way that when you uh, use a new notion about hash function, you will check that it at least holds for a random oracle. So here we do the same, but with a random language. Then uh, we prove that random languages are extremely uh, hard to solve, even if you weaken them. So we prove that even if you give to the adversary an inverter that will agree to invert all sufficiently, uh, that will sample all sufficiently likely pre-images to any oracle circuit, then even relative to this oracle, a random language is still amplifiable average case hard, and yet, relative to this oracle, there cannot be any fine grained one-way function because you can invert them with this inverter oracle. So together, this result two and three prove that fine grained one-way functions and amplifi amplifiable hardness are black box separated. So let's go over this, uh, this uh, second uh, result, so this two and three. So we use two oracles. Okay, the first one is this check oracle. It's a random language, and you can check whether a, a word is in the language or not if you found the right witness. And the second is an inversion oracle. So intuitively, what do we want? You feed to the inversion oracle an oracle circuit that can call the check, uh, the check oracle and an output, and it samples a random pre-image. However, this will be too strong because think, for example, about this simple example. Uh, consider the circuit that just takes as input some x and w. Okay, it queries x, w to the check oracle. And uh, it returns x and b, where b is the answer of the check oracle. The solver, uh, who would simply query the inverter on this circuit together with the output x1. Now, if x was indeed in the language, which just happens with priority 1 over 2, that means that the valid preimage will be a valid witness for x. So with a single call to the inverse oracle, I've been able to completely break all hardness properties about my language because I can find the witness in one call. But the reason why uh, the adversary managed to do that is because he asked to invert an output which was unlikely, in the sense that the pass from the input to this output makes a single query to check, and this single query makes a hit. And making a hit should be a low probability event. So what we do is a sequence of sanitizing of the circuit. So first we look at the, all the possible paths from an input to the output. And we say that if a pass contains too many hits compared to the average number of hits it should contain, then it's a heavy pass. And we'll remove all heavy pass, and we will only allow the oracle to answer a light pass from the input to the output. Now, for technical reasons, we cannot uh, force all paths to be too light, because if they have too light, later we'll have to do some kind of union bond over all gates to show that with high probability for random input, all paths will be sufficiently light. So to pass this union bond, we need to, to, to keep some room here and define a pass to be light if it's the average number of hits plus some kind of bond like necessary to, to, to allow this union bond. And it turns out that this uh, allows for other attacks based on what happens when you can make queries to the oracle with uh, inputs which are too large. And we have a different techniques to handle those too large queries by shaving the circuit. So you take the circuit, you look at all gates that uh, make a query to check where the input is too large, and you replace this gate by dummy gates. And we can show uh, with a bit of work that this suffices to get rid of this uh, annoying side effect. So proof intuition. Suppose you have an adversary that uh, breaks amplifiable hardness of your language, okay? From this adversary, we build an emulation procedure which accesses the check oracle and also uses some carefully crafted advice string, which is some information about L. We show that with this advice string, the emulator is able to correctly emulate all answers of the inversion oracle, 
Yet, the size of the advice string is not too large. It's of bounded size. So that means that if there is an adversary that can break amplifiable hardness, then we can build from it a new adversary that can get too many hits uh, when accessing the check oracle uh, when being additionally given a not too long advice string. And this we show is impossible using a new abstract technical lemma, which we call the heating lemma with advice, which I will explain uh, soon after. Then there is, before that, there is the other side of the proof, right? We want to show that relative to these two oracles, we don't have any fine grained one-way functions. So we have a hard language, but we don't have fine grained one-way functions. The intuition is just take your candidate fine grained one-way function and the output and query it to the universal oracle, and you hope to get a pre-image. We need to show that this works with high probability. Uh, so this boils down to showing that um, actually with high probability, the path from like one of the paths from pre-image to the output will be a light pass because our inversion oracle only agrees to invert if there is a light pass. And intuitively, the funny thing here is that you can think of your one-way function now as being an adversary that will be making queries, like these queries that it makes are the paths from the input to the output. And if there are no light paths, it means that you somehow get an adversary that can make too many hits again. And again, our heating lemma shows that this is not possible. So using the heating lemma, we can show that with very high probability, if you evaluate an arbitrary function on a random input, there will be a light pass uh, from an input to uh, the output that you got. So what is this heating lemma? It says the following. You have a bunch of sets in the skies. Uh, and in each of these sets, I pick a uniformly random element. And now an adversary is trying to get as many hits as possible. So the adversary has a budget of Q queries and he wants to, uh, he can ask questions of the form, is Ri equal to R star? And his goal is to get as many possible yes answers as possible, okay? And so the heating lemma shows that for any adversarial strategy, um, the probability that you do too many hits decrease exponentially. So this is the technical statement, forget about it. The intuition is, What's the naive strategy? Well, the naive strategy is you pick the smallest set and then you query one by one in any order uh, the elements in it until you get a hit. When you get it, you take the next smaller set, then you query it one by one and so on. Well, first we prove by induction that this naive strategy is the best possible strategy. And if you call H the number of hits that this naive strategy makes on average, we show that the probability of getting C hits more than this average decrease exponentially with C and the exponent in this uh, exponential decrease is actually more than one, uh, which is uh, uh, important for our proof to be tight enough to work. So yeah, uh, that's the intuition. And the very nice thing about this is that the, the bound is actually so tight that even if you allow the adversary to get an, an, an arbitrary advice about all these sets, you can directly extend the heating lemma to a heating lemma that takes into account this advice simply by guessing the advice in advance. Right, because the, the result is tight enough that just guessing the advice uh, only gives you a 2 to the k loss, which is already sufficient to derive a contradiction. So we get this uh, heating lemma with advice with an arbitrary advice of bounded size. Um, and that's the key to proving our first, uh, our core separation. Then I don't know how much time I have left, but yeah, okay, so another, so the positive results, just to go very quickly about it, uh, is getting fine random one-way functions from block finding hardness. So without going into details, with a block finding hard language, what we managed to build is a puzzle. A puzzle, it's something where you can easily generate an instance, but solving an instance takes some long time, okay, time n, for example. And the solution to the puzzle is just some integer. And uh, so how do we build our fine random one-way function? The idea is just, I, I'll generate n puzzles, I'll pick one of them at random and I'll solve it. So it takes time n to generate the puzzle, time n to solve one of them. And I give you the end puzzles and the solution and I ask you, can you find the puzzle which I solved? And intuitively, if the language is hard enough to find out which puzzle I solved, you will have to solve all the puzzle one by one, which takes quadratic time. And to prove that this intuition works, we have to, uh, uh, we need, the, the hardness we need is block finding hardness of the language. And so I won't have time to go over that, but uh, using the heating lemma with advice again, it's possible to prove that a random language does satisfy block finding hardness. So we, it provides some support for this uh, very strong hardness assumption. And yeah, that's the uh, end of my talk. That's a global summary of what I just said. I'd be, I'll be happy to answer any question. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? 
somebody can come. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can comment on this, but I do remember this Crypto 2018 paper by Marshall Ball and uh, Alan Rosen and others. Yeah. And they comment on uh, how it'd be surprising to obtain one-way functions from uh, some type of assumptions, the ones they have in that uh, particular case. Yeah. Now, how does this particular, the last result you showed to uh, one-way functions from block hardness, how does it what what's the relation between the surprising results they show yeah. and the so thank you for the question actually um though i, I tell the story in an order which fits uh, the, chrono the 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 way we write it in the paper the actual historical chronology of the paper is we started from this result and we wanted to get around the the limitation uh, they said and an idea we had was so what they show is from exponential time hypothesis you can get uh, what i just called here a, a cryptographic puzzle Right? You can build an average case hard cryptographic puzzle from exponential time hypothesis by going through uh, this orthogonal ve vector problem and then getting average case hardness out of it. And they managed to prove that actually this, uh, this is not only hard on average, it also satisfies this amplifiability property that I, told, that I spoke about. If you have many, many, many puzzles, solving them recurs, uh, uh, well, spending a time proportional to the number of puzzles. So we wanted exactly to get this, and we had this construction in mind. And um, basically, the, the unfortunate story is that our impossibility results, our black box impossibility results, show that uh, what they managed to prove about their puzzle, which is amplifiable hardness, does not suffice to go all the way to, f to find one way function. So it's another limitation in addition to the one they exhibited uh, to the program of building fine grained one way functions from exponential time hypothesis or strong exponential time hypothesis. And so this alternative road goes to, uh, through block finding hardness. But if you try to prove block finding hardness for their construction, then you end up having to prove. Um, so it uses this kind of, uh, of Bellicomp-Messi algorithm, uh, Bellicomp-Velsch algorithm, sorry, uh, and uh, essentially adapting the Bellicomp-Velsch algorithm to this notion of finding a pattern. Uh, it seems extremely hard. And uh, we've never managed to make any progress on that. Uh, I don't think it's feasible at all. Um, but yeah, so essentially we show new barriers toward using what they already showed uh, uh, to get finger and my functions, and we try to get around, but when getting around, we can't use anymore their construction. So we just need to abstract out the notion of what suffices to get what we get. Thank you. I think we need to move on to the next okay. part. So, Ashwiji. 